I'm a wildlife biologist. I do a lot of work in Northern California and Oregon, and during the summer I work nights. I'm female and do most of the work solo. Last summer, I was hiking in deep woods in Northern California, about an hour and a half from my truck with no cell phone service. Around 1.30 a.m., I'd finished up surveys and was heading back, when I suddenly smelled something odd. I continued up the hill, and as I came over the top, I was suddenly on the edge of a large camp. The area was cleared, and I could see several tents and UTVs and trash everywhere. That weird smell, it was a porta potty. I could also see a fire pit with several figures sitting around it. I stopped dead, immediately dropped to the ground, and scrambled behind a tree. I was close enough to hear some mumbled conversation and occasional loud laughter. The only reason there would be a camp that far into the wilderness would be to grow weed illegally. These people can be very violent, and many people involved in the industry go missing every year. Women especially can be swept into sex trafficking, never to be seen again. I got out my spot device, GPS locator, and satellite messaging, and I sent my location and situation to my supervisor. I crawled as quietly as possible back down the hill before retracing my steps to take a long way around. My adrenaline ran high until I got to the safety of my truck, and I crashed hard and cried on the phone to my supervisor. That was one of the more terrifying moments in my career. I've had several encounters alone with large predators, but nothing is scarier than encountering a group of strangers alone in the deep woods. I'd like to first say that you don't have to feel bad if you don't believe me, because I struggle so much with believing it too. I wasn't alone. My best friend also saw it, and she struggles as much as I do with not believing what we saw. I'm almost 60 years old, and I'm a wildlife and landscape photographer from East Tennessee. I'm from Townsend, which is located in the Smoky Mountains, and I no longer live at the location where this happened, but I'm still close by. On the night of the new moon in July 2018, my best friend, Deb, came over to my house at around 11.30pm because we were going to go up the hill from my house to an empty rental cabin to take pictures at the Milky Way over Rich Mountain. I know it was the night of the new moon, because that's the best night of the month for night sky photography since the moon won't wash out the light from the stars. If you stood on my road where you turn into my driveway, it actually looks like you're turning into the driveway of the rental cabin, because we shared the same driveway. You pull into the rental and curve left down our long gravel driveway to the mobile home we lived in before we moved into our house where we are now. Straight across the street from the rental cabin is what locals have always called the shale pit. It's just an empty lot, about an acre or two big. There's a family from Townsend who owns it, and they use it to dig up shale for new driveways of houses. That was their business. They built driveways, but their part was just to dig it and lay down the shale. They also let the National Park bring trees there to use the space to burn them after they've collected them, whenever they'd have bad storms, strong winds, or heavy snow. There wasn't a house there or any other form of structure, just a big lot with a couple of backhoes for digging. They did put a small mobile home on the lot for the owner's grandson, but that didn't happen until 2020 during the pandemic. Okay, here it goes. Deb and I had taken her car up the driveway to the rental cabin, and we parked right in front, and her car was parallel to the road. The road was about 10 yards from the car, and the entrance to the shale pit was across the one-lane road we lived on, so that would be about 10 more yards. That means 20 yards total from the car to the entrance of the shale pit. We set our tripods up and had each taken a couple of shots of the night sky. When I heard what sounded like tires on gravel somewhere down at the river, 
You have to cross a bridge over the river to get to my house and all the houses on that road. The shale pit included, of course. I said out loud to her, someone's down at the river. I can't remember if she heard it or not, but just a few seconds later, we heard a loud truck that sounded like it was crossing the bridge and starting up my road. It might be a quarter of a mile from the bridge to my driveway, probably less. We could hear that the truck was going really slow, and it sounded like it was really old and barely running. As it got closer, I asked Deb if she locked her car, since we were on the back side of the cabin and we couldn't see it from there. She said she hadn't. Deb has thousands of dollars worth of camera gear, and she had a lot of it with her that night. Without speaking, we both took our cameras off of our tripods and carried them and the tripods back to her car to lock it. I don't remember why we brought it all with us. I think we both just had a weird feeling about the truck. I know I definitely did. I don't even know what to say, other than it sounded like it was creeping around the area because it was going so slow. I could have walked as fast as that truck was going. When we got back to her car, we set our stuff in the back seat right as the truck got to where it was even with the cabin and us. It was a dark colored truck and it looked like it maybe could have been something like a Chevy S10 made back in the 70s or 80s. We couldn't see who was driving or how many people were in it. The truck stopped and turned into the driveway to the cabin, which means it was also turning into my driveway. It only got two wheels onto the property when it stopped. It backed up across the street into the entrance of the shale pit. Its lights were shining directly into our eyes. It just sat there with its loud, sad motor running. Deb asked me what the hell they were doing, and I said, I don't know, but they're starting to piss me off because they know they're blinding us with their headlights. I waited about 10 more seconds before I reached into my pocket and pulled out my maglite flashlight and turned the dial around the bulb to high beam. Then I turned it on and pointed it right at the truck. I had intended on shining my obnoxiously bright flashlight at them until they turned their headlights off or drove away. Well, they did turn their headlights off and in turn, I turned my flashlight off. They didn't turn the motor off though. This was creepy, and my stomach kind of churned because I thought I'd pissed them off. And we were up at that empty rental cabin after midnight, and my husband was all the way back down at our house, asleep. The truck stayed there for about another half minute, and then it finally turned its motor off, and it was gone. Yes. I swear upon everything that I've ever loved, that truck just wasn't there anymore. We didn't see it fade away. It didn't turn off like a light switch or television. It just wasn't there anymore. Then Deb and I both did something totally out of character for two old ladies. We ran to where the truck had been sitting. I couldn't say a word, but Deb, well, she yelled over and over. What the fuck did I just see? I told her to stop screaming so I could call Jack, my husband. I was hysterical and told him to get up the hill as fast as he could. He also drove up instead of walking and he was there in no more than two minutes. I told him a very short version of what had happened and he went across the street to the shale pit and pulled in as far as he could. It's all just dirt and rock. There aren't even trees there since they dig in that area. The only trees are the ones the park brings there to burn, and there weren't any of those at the time. He came back across the street and said there's nobody and nothing over there except two backhoes. They must have left and you all just didn't see them. We explained the whole thing again, and he realized that they couldn't have left without us seeing them since we were standing right in front of them. So, he went back over there on foot this time with my flashlight, since it has the high beam setting on it. Again, he came back and said there's nothing there. He said he even looked inside the cabs at the back hose, just in case. There's actually a ridge above the shale pit lot 
but it's vertical and about a hundred feet high. This one acre lot is literally just dirt and rock with nowhere to go and nowhere to hide, even for a person, let alone a whole truck. We didn't take any more pictures. We went back down to the house and Jack went inside. I was outside with Deb and she said, Kelly, there's no need to go in there and try to convince him of what we saw. It's ridiculous and you can't expect him to believe you. It'll just cause an argument. We saw what we saw, but nobody is ever going to believe us. And now, we don't even believe us. We talk about it sometimes and laugh about it, but it's not really that funny. Because even though we know we saw what we saw, what did we see? If it were a scary movie, you'd think the truck would just turn the motor off first and leave the headlights on and then disappear. But no, it turned off its lights and we could very clearly see the truck sitting just yards from us. The motor goes off and it was like I blinked and it was gone, maybe even in less than a blink. How can an inanimate object be a ghost? I'm not sure I even believe in ghosts at all, but I saw that truck disappear, and as I type those words, I full on understand how ridiculous and stupid it sounds. But it happened, but I don't even believe it. It's a weird place to be in, and Deb is in that exact same place. I believe in God, so I guess that means I believe in the supernatural, since God is supernatural. But I don't believe in disappearing trucks, but I saw one disappear. Can you all understand what I'm saying? I don't believe what I saw, but I saw it. It drives me crazy, pun intended. In my mid-twenties, I worked at a subacute rehab facility. Generally, these places exist to help those who are struggling after an accident or surgery to regain their mobility and quality of life with the help of physical therapy and around-the-clock nursing care. I worked in a dementia unit. These patients were long-term, and most ended up living out the rest of their days there. Although it was called the dementia unit, our patients were comprised of those suffering from permanent or long-term brain-related conditions. These included dementia slash Alzheimer's, comas, strokes, traumatic brain injuries, and brain tumors. Here are some of the experiences I had while working there. Number one, I had just clocked in for the evening and received report from the day shift nurse. I was standing at the end of the hallway with my back against the wall, reviewing the notes I'd taken from the previous nurse. Whilst reading over my slip of paper, I felt what could only be described as a hand dragging its fingers horizontally across my abdomen. I jerked back and looked around, but I was completely alone. Number two. Although I do not have a particular story about call lights, it was a normal occurrence to have call lights in empty rooms triggered, even in rooms where the wires that were attached to call buttons were unplugged from the wall. Some nights, the nurses would be forced to respond to several phantom calls from empty rooms. Number three, at the very end of one of our halls contained a habitually empty room. The heat slash air conditioning unit was broken, so patients were never placed there. The nurses and aides would use that room for privacy during personal phone calls to go to the bathroom in peace or do whatever else that required some seclusion. One evening, I headed into that room's bathroom to touch up my makeup and fix my hair. I left the bathroom door slightly ajar while going about my business. I was putting my hair up in a bun when the bathroom door slammed shut behind me. Mid-heart attack, I spun around and jerked the door back open. The room was empty. The time it would have taken a human to exit the room would have been longer than what it took me to open the bathroom door. 
I'd also like to note that there was no furniture in the room, nothing a human could have hid behind. I'm convinced it wasn't a living person who slammed that door. Number four. One patient we had residing in the long-term unit was a middle-aged woman with severe Down syndrome. She was mostly non-verbal, save for a few words she would utter randomly. She was very sweet and always had a smile on her face. It was my turn to help her eat dinner the night this story takes place. She didn't have the motor skills to eat properly, so I spoon-fed her while we caught up on cartoons on her TV set. But this particular night, she acted completely out of character. I didn't notice it first because I was engrossed in the show we were watching. I failed to notice her attempts to get my attention. She finally resorted to using grunts to call me away from the TV screen. When I did finally notice, she seemed overjoyed with something. Her mouth was stretched into a wide grin and she was pointing at an empty corner in the back of her room. I could clearly see the corner, but nothing else. I looked back and forth between her and the corner, but I couldn't understand what she was trying to communicate. She was pointing, giggling, and waving at apparently nothing in the corner. I tried asking her what she was trying to show me, in the form of simple yes and no questions that she could shake or nod her head to. I became uneasy with her actions because I knew she was seeing something that I could not. After I finished up feeding her, I walked back out to the hallway and was immediately approached by a fellow nurse. My stomach sank and I felt queasy while she told me the next door neighbor of the woman I was just feeding had passed away during dinner time. Number 5. It's not my story. This was told to me by a fellow nurse. My friend Mary worked the night shift at the same rehab as I, but this story takes place years before I was hired there. Mary was close to one of her patients, and she went out of her way to make her feel special. The patient was an elderly woman with no living family and was chronically lonely. Her name was Emily. When Mary bonded with Emily, it became a habit of Emily's to wait by her room's window so when she saw Mary walking up to the building, she could wave. This became a special occasion for Emily, and the two would wave to one another before and after Mary's shift while she traveled to and from the employee parking lot. Then Emily fell ill and was unable to get out of her bed for a while. Every time Mary pulled up from work, she would check to see if Emily was waiting by the window. When she didn't see her, she would know, walking in, that Emily was sick. This went on for a few weeks. Mary would pull into the parking lot, hoping to see her sweet patient up and out of bed and waiting patiently to wave to her. But then one day, Mary showed up at work and saw Emily standing at her window, peering out over the employee parking lot. Mary was thrilled and hopped out of her car and gave Emily a gleeful wave. But Emily stood motionless and did not react to Mary's exuberant greeting. Puzzled, Mary headed into the building, only to quickly find out Emily passed away earlier that day. I hope you enjoyed these stories as much as I enjoy sharing them. Last weekend, my five-year-old and I went tent camping in the Unitas northeast of Utah. The weather was overcast weather. By the time we got done paddle boarding, we made our way back to camp. Once we got back to camp, I couldn't shake this feeling of unease. I mostly shrugged it off, thinking I'm overthinking the safety of my child. One thing to point out, there was a trailer and a truck close to us, but I never saw anyone throughout our experience from there. At around 8 p.m., we started our campfire. We roasted brats and ate snacks. During this time, I would think I heard a crack or a subtle movement, and I thought it was just the embers popping. Once the sun finally set, 
I noticed it was completely pitch black outside the reach of our campfire, most likely due to the overcast weather. At this point, I decided it's time to pack up our food and take it to the car, but I had this sudden feeling that I was being watched, and I decided to turn my headlamp light on. I faced 30 degrees to the right of me. About 40 to 50 feet from us, I see a small bush-like tree, and above the tree, standing behind it, I see two big circle white eyes with a hint of purple staring at me. The animal or creature was far enough from the glow of the fire that I couldn't see a silhouette of a body, but it was close enough that it was odd behavior and it was only seconds from us if it ran towards us. My first thought was it was a bear standing on its hind legs, just being curious. It looked to be eight feet tall or so. As I had my light facing the creature that was abnormally close to our campsite, I grabbed my kiddo and bear spray, and I told my kid there's a bear behind a tree and assured him we will be fine. This creature just watched us intently. Suddenly, a few seconds later, my intuition screamed, get out now. I then started walking backwards towards my car and told my kid to walk slowly with me. The creature made no movement and tilted its eyes on us as we moved away until my light could no longer reach it. I can't explain this new type of fear I was experiencing. It was unnatural. I think prioritizing my boy's safety allowed me to get us to the car in a much more composed manner. Once in the car, we waited 30 minutes to see if it would come into the campsite to look for food, but nothing happened. I thought perhaps it left and we could sleep in the car to be safe. I decided that I was going to try and grab blankets from the tent, put the fire out, and we can pack out first thing in the morning. I thought wrong. The campsite from the car was about 150 feet away. To the right of us were big trees, and to the left is tall grass and brush. I get out and turn my headlamp on. My light shines toward the brush, and laying low in the brush, I see the white eyes again, staring at me. I decided to try to act big and yell out at the creature, but it made a move towards me, which in return made me jump back into the car and reverse. I tried to shine my car lights towards it, but I couldn't see anything. I decided to find help. I drive down and find a friendly fellow dad camper who's happy to help me pack up my things and leave. He arrives with a much brighter flashlight and his truck. As I'm packing, he sees the eyes and mentions there's two of them. He states they're not moose, deer, cougars, and if it is a bear, it's really odd behavior, and he doesn't know exactly what they are. I face towards where he's shining his light, and I see a second pair of white eyes. At this point, I am terrified. One of them is standing tall, while the other is lower. This time, they are much further back, as if they now know there's a new reach limit to the light devices being used. It wasn't until the lower set of eyes decided to stand up and be much taller than the first one, looking monstrous. This made my new friend very uneasy, and he quotes, This has got me on edge. Let's just throw everything in your car and leave. The whole time we're packing out, I would catch these creatures creating a perimeter around us. They just walked around the campground in circles, waiting for something, it seemed. I tried to think of rational possible theories, but the more I think about it, the more I can't shake the feeling that this could have been a skinwalker or something else. They were too smart, intuitive, bold, scary, and didn't act like normal wildlife. Any thoughts on these creatures would mean the world to me. Thank you for listening to this. I was getting goosebumps retelling this story.
I've never believed in ghosts. I've openly mocked people that did. I went camping, and my wife and I were going to sleep in the pole barn. We brought the dog into the barn, and immediately she was freaking out. It's very uncommon for such a relaxed and tired dog. She was walking around the air mattress and whining. After about five minutes of me telling her to calm down, a light shines through the aluminum siding. Imagine holding a flashlight on the other side of the curtain doing a figure eight. It seemed like there was some sort of flashlight shining through the aluminum door. I don't mention anything for a few minutes as I'm questioning everything I've ever known to be true. My wife asks, do you see that? I say, oh fuck, you see it too. At that exact moment, I realized we both saw it. It turned out to be the brightest orb I've ever seen. It lit up the whole barn as if it was daytime. It then started floating towards us. I yelled at my wife to run, and the dog was already at the door. We ran as fast as we could, and we didn't dare go back to get the air mattress. Our dog would never walk in that pole barn again. This happened to me when I was six. I was in my bed, sound asleep, when I felt the mattress beside me slowly shift as if someone was lying beside me. I opened my eyes and there was a full-grown adult woman beside me. She wasn't particularly scary, just normal looking, but she was a strange person in my bed. Of course I opened my mouth to scream, but before I did, she put her finger to her lips as if to tell me to be quiet. Her eyes looked very frightened and she seemed to be silently pleading for me to keep quiet. Of course I screamed my guts out, and I heard my parents getting up out of their bed. The strange woman just looked very sad. Her eyes were full of tears. My dad turned my bedroom light on, and as soon as he did, she just wasn't there anymore. There was no sign of her at all. I slept in my parents' room that night. I was very scared, but even more so, I had a deep feeling of sadness. That was decades ago, and I still remember it clearly. I've had a few run-ins like that, different people though, but never that same woman. The story of Teke Teke will haunt the minds of those brave enough to listen. It tells the tale of a young woman who met a gruesome fate, her body cut in half by a train. Left with only her upper torso, she roams the street with a bone-chilling sound, Teke Teke, Teke Teke, as she propels herself forward with claw-like hands. Encounters with Teke Teke are said to result in a gruesome demise. Witnesses describe her bloodied form, her face twisted in agony and malice as she pursues her victims with relentless determination. Some say she seeks revenge for her own tragic end, while others believe she yearns for companionship, luring unsuspecting souls into her clutches. As she's said to carry a sharp saw or scythe, I think the former. Those who hear the ominous sound of Teke Teke's approach are given a fleeting chance to escape, but few can outrun her supernatural speed. When I was a teenager, I was big into skateboarding and building ramps and shit. There was a neighborhood being built behind mine, and I'd go over there on the weekends and get scrap wood and bring it back to my house. You had to go through a little bit of woods and cross a creek to get there. I went one day by myself, and when I crossed the creek and started walking through the woods to the construction site, I could hear a man talking. I stood still to try to hear what he was saying. It was getting louder, as if he was coming through the woods towards me, and I finally heard what he was saying. 
He made a little jingle, singing, I'm gonna get you. I couldn't hear any leaves crunching, and I never saw anyone. I ran like hell and was slipping while I was trying to climb up the muddy bank in the creek. I don't believe in ghosts or anything, but that's one thing that stuck with me that I cannot explain. Can someone please let me know their thoughts on this? So, I'm 31 and female, and I've been living at the same apartment complex for nearly four years. There's a guy who's about 45 or so, who lives on the same floor as me, and he has for about the past year or so. He is so awful. I usually don't notice or recognize a lot of people who live there, but I quickly started noticing this guy because of how rude he is. Whenever we would happen to go downstairs in the elevator together in the morning before work, he would just mean mug me. And then when we would walk out of the glass doors into the parking lot, I would be walking behind him, and he'd let the doors close on me and not hold them open. One day, about six months ago, my fiancé and I walked up behind him, waiting for the elevator, and when he saw us, he was standing in front of us and just shook his head almost in disgust. Keep in mind, my fiancé nor I have ever had a conversation with this man. Then, where things really get strange, about six months ago, I decided to hold the elevator doors open for him when I saw him coming down the hall. He said thank you, and when we got downstairs for the first time ever, he held the doors open for me. The next time my then fiancé, now husband, saw him in the parking lot, whenever he saw my now husband with me, he mouthed, fucking bitch, to himself as he passed us. But to make things worse, whenever I see him alone in the parking lot, he smiles and smirks at me as he walks past, as if we had history together or like we knew each other personally. It's so weird. But about a month ago, when he saw my husband and I together once again in the mail room, he covered his face with his mail. Can someone please explain to me what the hell they think is going on with this man? I took a lot of psychology classes in college, and I can't even explain this behavior. I'm getting strange serial killer vibes. Like I said, we've literally never had a conversation with him. My husband and I are both very friendly people, and I feel like we're giving off those vibes. It's so strange. This story takes place in the summer of 2017. My name is John. I live in a rural part of Alabama, but I chose to work in the city. The drive is about 45 minutes or so, depending on traffic. However, by the time I pick my son up from the sitter, get dinner, and get home, I've been in the car about one and a half hours. My house is surrounded by trees, and the neighbors are few and far between. It can be pretty lonely living here, but I enjoy the privacy. One evening, I pulled into my driveway and noticed something odd. The doors on my storage shed were wide open. I told my son to sit in the car as I got out to investigate. I didn't see anything missing and closed the doors back. I know the wind had not blown them open because it has two latches that you have to undo in order to get it open. The next day, I looked around and much to my dismay, two weed eaters along with a few other garden tools were missing. I know I should have contacted the police, but I knew there wasn't much they could do at that point. Throughout the week, I had some time off and decided to tackle some yard work that I needed to get done, which included cutting down a medium-sized tree that had grown next to my house. Once I cut it down, it took everything I had to move it to the edge of my property just inside the woods. I planned on cutting it up another day, Fast forward to the next Friday night. I left for work at 7pm, picked up my son, and we arrived home at 8.30pm. 
As I pulled into the driveway, my son and I noticed something laying across the driveway. It looked as if a tree branch had fallen across it. As I drove up to it, I thought to myself, there are no trees over my driveway. Once I looked towards the base of the tree, my heart sank to the bottom of my stomach. It was the tree I cut down. I had put it clear on the other side of my property until I could cut it up. I recognized the marking from my chainsaw. I didn't know what to do. My son and I sat there in silence for at least five minutes. I rolled the driver and passenger window down just an inch and listened to hear if anyone was out there. I heard nothing. I then realized in order for me to get to my house, I would have to move the tree. I told my son I was going to get out and move it just enough so we could get past, and I would lock the doors. If anything happens, he could use my phone to call the neighbor who lived the closest. I darted out of my car and moved the tree slightly and raced back. I was terrified. Luckily, my son was ready to unlock the doors for me to get back in. I drove up towards my house and we got in safely. I didn't sleep well that night. The next day, I woke up to find the tree was moved again, this time a few feet behind my car. To this day, I'm still baffled at who could have done this or what their intentions were. Next time, I will be smarter and call the police. I do have another question that I can't answer. How did someone know where I put the tree after I cut it down? Whoever had done this had to have been watching me. I had put the tree in the woods. That thought alone is enough to keep me up some nights. Thanks for listening. This happened back in 2018. I was 24 and my sister was 25. We're both native New Yorkers and there are plenty of stories I have. I think we all know New York is strange. Anyway, we were on a crowded train going to meet up with a friend. There were no seats, so we had to hold onto the pole. It's already a tight squeeze, but this man and this girl, non-related, get on and they hold onto the pole that my sister and I are both holding. We're talking, and I notice that the man directly in front of us keeps on looking at us, like really looking. I'm already feeling uncomfortable as it is, and it's hard not to pay attention. I try to ignore it by talking to my sister. By the way, we are nowhere near our destination. A couple train stops later, he eventually says to us, are you guys sisters? We both look at one another, feeling awkward, and I'm like, yeah. At this point, I'm praying that the train would hurry up to the next stop so we can get off. I know my sister is thinking the same thing. The other girl is looking at us, and she looks uncomfortable. He smiles and seems to get excited, if you know what I mean. He then says to us, oh yeah. You guys are sisters, in an incredibly perverted tone. He licks his lips and keeps looking from my sister to me, back and forth. At this point, the girl gives us an awkward smile, and she looks just as terrified as we do. I can tell that this man is getting really excited by the fact we're sisters, and he comments on how beautiful we are. My sister looks at me, and we see a stop coming up. We both know it's not our stop, but we're leaving the train. He keeps trying to talk to us, and we keep ignoring him. And as soon as the doors open, we leave the train. Again, I've been in many weird and uncomfortable situations, but the fact that he was literally so close to us with his perverted smile, his excited eyes, and excitement, you know what? Yeah, I'm glad we were able to get away from him safely. Thankfully, 
he didn't follow us. This is pretty out there, but when I was a child having an asthma fit, my mother gave me some medication, but it got worse, so she gave me more medication, but the two aren't supposed to mix. I started tripping balls, as a three-year-old trips I guess, and I saw a skeleton woman in a black robe. I started hysterically screaming, and my parents had me sleep on a cot in the hallway with the lights on. I kept referring to her as... Asmona. My guess is from my mom mentioning the asthma medication and me moaning or something. Little kid stuff. Flash forward eight years or so. Different house, different city. I was getting out of the shower and looked in the mirror. It was Asmona. I screamed and climbed into my bunk and covered myself with blankets, freaking out until my parents found me. My best guess is it was just fog on a mirror that somehow looked close enough to what I hallucinated as a toddler, and that unlocked a repressed memory and caused me to panic. I tried to tell my parents about it, but they just laughed it off and said I was making up both incidents. I grew up on a small property in regional Australia. We lived about three to four kilometers out of town, so not really far, but also far enough we never really got disturbed. On top of that, we were on a dead-end street, down the end of another street off the main road, so not once have I ever seen any pedestrian near my house. Anyway, one night when I was about 12, I was watching TV when two of my brothers came downstairs and said, Did you hear that? I was pretty glued to the TV, so I didn't hear a thing. But apparently, they heard footsteps outside and a couple of hushed voices. Seeing as my brothers were both around 20 and both big rugby playing guys, their plan was for me to wait inside while they ran outside and tackled anybody they could find before calling the cops. So they both sprinted out the front door at the same time, splitting in different directions to wrap around the house and meet again on the other side, presumably each with a criminal wrapped in a headlock under their arm. If you've ever seen that movie, Sides, where Mel Gibson and Walking Phoenix run around the house, basically just picture that. Anyway, they never found them. They swear to this day that they heard voices, but nobody was ever seen. Our property has a lot of thick bushland right up to the house, so all we can think is that when my brothers came out, these guys just dissolved back into the bush and watched. They then probably just took off once the coast was clear again. The whole thing scared the hell out of me. One night, I was driving from North Dakota to Nebraska, and I was passing through a section of South Dakota that sits between the Rosebud and Pine Ridge Reservations. I was in the absolute middle of nowhere, no lights for miles, perfectly clear winter sky, amazing stars, and all of a sudden, a meteor burns up in the sky above, turning the sky green for a few seconds. I stopped and just thought about how lucky I was to see that. As I keep driving, I come up to a small town where the only intersection is a four-way stop in the middle of the town. I assumed it was a ghost town because there were no lights of any kind, but as I came to a stop, my car lights lit up the area around me, and people were just walking around in the dark, acting like it was normal. It's the middle of the night, maybe 10 or 20 degrees maximum. Needless to say, I didn't stop again until I got to a town with street lights. I think those areas are a little more wild or spiritual. Wounded Knee was near there, 
and that part of the U.S. had terrible atrocities committed against the natives. I think it's left its mark on that place. In Snohomish, Washington, there's a bar called the Oxford. It has a violent history, as there have been at least two or three deaths or murders there. My parents have gone a few times to listen to live bands, and heard of women being locked in the bathroom, and plates shattering in the kitchen when no one was around. One night, my dad had a glass of red wine and headed downstairs to the basement, where there's pool tables and another bar. He said that the cup part of his glass exploded in his hand. There was a pop sound. He looked down, and he only had the wine glass stem in his hand, and there was no red wine or glass on or around him. In a bit of a daze, he went to the bartender, handed her the stem, and explained what had happened. She replied, No problem. That kind of stuff happens all the time. And she handed him a new glass. Guide spirits, angels, whatever you want to call them. I had a similar thing screw with my head pretty bad once. That same feeling of go here, turn there, like a mental GPS direction. So for important context, I live over 300 miles from where I grew up. I was sitting at my computer one night at like about 10 p.m. and just had this massive urge to get up and go somewhere. So I put on my shoes and jump in my truck. Then it was that feeling, turn here, go there, pull into this parking lot. I just kind of followed it. I had arrived at Whataburger. There are three in my town, and this one is the furthest from the apartment I was in at the time. I drove probably 10 miles to reach this one, but I had one that was a mile and a half from my apartment. But food sounded good so I figured it was just my gut deciding for me. I walk in, and there's this guy stumbling around incoherent, bothering customers and being a nuisance, and generally seeming drunk off his ass. He turns to me, though, and I get a look at him. I had several classes with him in high school. He was diabetic as fuck, and let his sugar levels get all screwed up to the point of not being able to function. A similar incident happened in school with him once, so as soon as I recognized him and saw him acting similarly, I got a cup of soda in him to level him out. It took me five seconds to realize what the issue was and save him from probably dying in a county drunk tank, since the store had called the cops already. It's some weird shit. As soon as I saw him, I had the same aha moment of this is what you're here for. This happened about 20 years ago while hunting with my dad in northern British Columbia. It was a cold October morning, and it was still dark when we parked the truck and started our hike into a clear cut. I was familiar with the area as we'd moose hunted there before. My dad went to the left and I went to the right. I made my way to the top of a slope to get a better view of the clear cut. I found a stump to sit on and took out my binoculars and quickly found my dad in the clear cut across the mountain. As soon as I spotted him, I heard something move behind me in the forest, roughly 40 yards away. I'm thinking, Yes, a moose. I then head towards the forest's edge when I hear a scream or screech unlike anything I've ever heard. It did not sound human, and it wasn't like any animal I've heard before. It was so loud, and I swear my soul left my body for a few seconds. I turned around and ran down that clear-cut hill as fast as my teenage legs would take me. When I got to my dad, he said he heard it too and found me in his binoculars running down the clear cut 
then looked up at the forest's edge and said he saw a big, hairy, human-like creature standing about eight foot tall between two birch trees. It stayed for a few seconds and turned around and was gone. We got to the truck and went home for the day. We asked elders and relatives about it when we got back, and they called them the Forest Guardians. It still scares the hell out of me. A couple good friends of mine fight fires, and in Washington State, Summer business is usually booming. This year, a fair-sized crew of about 10 of them are miles and miles deep into the Cascades doing dig lines. I'm talking like 60 miles away from anything, middle of nowhere. As they're hiking through, they come to a clearing, and there's two landed Black Hawk helicopters and about seven fully armed military personnel. They all point their rifles at the fire crew and demand to know what they're doing there. My friend tells them they're doing fire digs and they're scheduled to be up there. They're told to turn around and forget that they saw anything up there. My friend says, but this is government work. We have to do this. This is our job. One of the military personnel says, not today. You're done. Get the fuck out of here now. Some serious chronicle type shit. I've never wanted to know so badly about what the hell was going on out there. I was 14 years old, moose hunting in northern British Columbia, Canada, with my dad. My feet got cold so I got down from the tree stand to walk around, get the blood flowing and whatnot. Not 30 seconds later, my dad very calmly says, Mike, get back up in the stand. Being a teenager, naturally, I was defiant. 10 seconds go by, I hear, Mike, get your fucking ass back in this tree stand, right fucking now. Now, up until that point in my life, I'd never heard my dad say, fuck, like ever. So I figured, hey, maybe I should listen. And I climbed back up the stand. My dad grabbed my face and jerked my head to the right, where I saw an absolute unit of a silver tip grizzly charging down the trail towards where I was standing. Another 10 seconds and I could have been chow. That is depending on how good a shot my dad would have been. This didn't happen to me, but it happened to my mom's friend. One day, the friend and her sister were driving on a freeway, and I don't remember how this happened, but the car crashed and flipped and rolled over five lanes. My mom's friend was the only one conscious, and she was trapped under the steering wheel, and her sister's head was bleeding really bad. She said a normal-looking man, wearing white, appeared out of nowhere, and then came up to them. He took off his shirt to wrap the sister's head, and then he left. When the paramedics arrived, they asked who wrapped the sister's head, and she told them, the paramedics asked where he went, and she pointed to the direction he walked in. The paramedics said they'd just come from that direction, and no one was on the road for miles. They also said that he wrapped her head in such a perfect way that she would have bled out and died if he hadn't done that. Shortly after 9-11, taking a flight home and a guy sitting across the aisle from me told me he blows planes like this one up for a living. I felt instantly lightheaded. I went up front and told the flight attendant. She thought the guy was making a poor attempt to flirt with me. In hindsight, 20 years later, she was probably right. 
but in the heat of that terrible moment, I was ready to have a full-blown panic attack. If I remember rightly, they landed the plane and the guy was taken for questioning. I was pretty mortified. Actually, I still am. There were probably a lot of mad people who just wanted to get to where they were going. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you'd like me to read on the channel, please send me an email or post it to my subreddit. You can find details of this in the video description. It's the stories that make this, and this is the best way to ensure variety in the stories I share. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my channel members and patrons who now have special access to ad-free videos and other behind-the-scenes content. Leah McBride Emily Pearson Tyler Wilson Lynn Meeks Kristen Birdo Shaz Betty Brantley Candice Lee Africa Winfield Becca Lydia Adams, Girl Veteran, Legends CBZ 69 2012, Katrina King, Hospital Cakewalk, Dirty Diana, Quinta Siegel, Shirley Porch, Taylor Ruiz, Annalisa Petrie, Jasmine Davis, Janelle Jensen, Jasper Roth, Alex, Monica Levelace, James Gargano, Sarah P, Fire 05, Mad as a Felter, Tierra Sanders, Melissa Kingery, Kitty Cat Luna 2, Chelsea Moffat, Ryan, Gabrielle, Jenny, Sarah, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Sam, Amanda Jane, Vampy Debs, October Gypsy, Rebecca, Erica B, Maribel De Luna, Lloyd Rash, Jennifer Jenkins, Kelly Townsend, Mary Wright, Tara Harris, Elizabeth Knapp, Eddie, Sean Gorman, Sue Gordon, Spider's Web, Kay, Christy, Absinthe Alice, Dina Kingery, Snowball Rathena, Lady Drackard, Brenda, Pretty Girl 215, Amber Davis, Sigma Cube X, Leticia Acklin, Ali O'Neill, Gina Eberhardt, Lilypad, Ashley Nicole, Sarah Chifalo, May 2nd, 2003, Bella Plays, 2006, Skin Crawler, Stephanie McLaren, Borderline Betty, Kuro, Top Off, Kelly Ann Bain, Michael O'Malley, Neil Kavanagh, The Dead Movie Society, Diana Johnston, Taya Atwell, Danielle, Possum Posse, Crafty Kell, Brooke, Scott McKenzie, Megan Abrams, Jane Wiggins, Jasmine Davis, Jack White, Your Pappy's Dilly, Emma Lisa, Tanya Ferguson, The Wendy, Amber Hops, Alexia Tuttle, Ram Beltran, Elizabeth Mayers, Unladylike 13, Pegasus Genesis, Sheila Grant 44, Sona, Scout Mom 405, Cheryl Duckworth, Ashley Bray, Angela Reeves, Kim Thompson, Brock Bollard, Nick Bigdowski, Jessica Lasley, Yennefer, Clary Scott, Timothy Stratton, Melissa Kingery, Shane Stevens, Serge Vargas, Bart in Real Life, April Jordanet, Lisa Prentice, Mason Hayes, Sarah Price, Jasmine Thomas, Angie Lindon, Z. Harris, Kirby Harris, Yolo Sapien, Lavina Cordelia, Misty Racure, Michelle Green, Dixie Busby, Paula Ferreira Nieves, Samantha Place, Donna Cox, Stephen Wheeler, Melissa Moore, Deshaun Edmondson, This Bad Kitty, Gloria, Christina Myway, Connie Sue, Carol Zeferano, Merciful Humming, Kelsa Rundle, Ashley Juster, Vicky Howell, Joe Tozer, Zoe D, Nicholas Johnson, Kimmy Love. Once again, thank you guys for listening. Have a great night.